Solutions to the Dropout Crisis. Addressing the dropout crisis one strategy at a time. Brought to you by the National Dropout Prevention Center with support from Penn Foster and Catapult Learning and in partnership with Clemson Broadcast Productions. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome once again to Solutions. It's great to have you with us, and here we are in December. The holidays are about to start. I'm already in my Christmas sweater, Sandy Addis. It's really good to have you here. For those of you who don't know Sandy Addis, and I don't know there's too many people who don't, Sandy Addis is the director of the National Dropout Prevention Center, and I'm so glad you're with me today. This is great, Sandy. Thank you, Marty. Happy holidays to you, and happy holidays to our viewers yeah. and our listeners out there. Yeah, this is a Christmas present. It is. I, I it really, really is. It's our Christmas show. Yeah, it really is our Christmas show, and what a show. It's not often we have a Crystal Star Award winner as our guest. That's true, Marty. We have, we have one of our outstanding Crystal Star Award winners we'll hear from shortly. Yes, we will. But meanwhile, even though the holidays are all a bustle, there's all a, always a bustle going on at the National Dropout Prevention Center and normally we'll talk about one or two events but boy Sandy's come with three <laughs> big events coming up in 2016 which will be here less than a month from now. Marty in the next six months we have three major exciting events professional learning opportunities for dropout prevention practitioners uh, all, all over the country. Uh, in February starting February 14th and ending on February 17th down at Myrtle Beach South Carolina mm -hmm. we have the uh, National At-Risk Youth Forum. That's always one of our, our premier events. Uh, it'll be a, a, a large event this year with, with, with a number of, of exciting keynote presenters, a number of uh, practitioners, uh, probably close to 100 breakout sessions. Right. So we, we encourage our, our uh, viewers to, to look on our website and consider coming down to Myrtle Beach. It's a great time mm. in uh, February. You know, that's, that's always a good one. For those who miss the national conference, this is a great little bit smaller version of it, mm -hmm. but it's still power packed with great presenters and so much dropout prevention strategies for people to learn. So that's a good start to the year. What's next? It is, Marty. And then uh, in, in March, March the 6th through the 9th, out in Oklahoma City, we have the National Forum on Dropout Prevention for Native and Tribal Communities. Uh, that's always a fascinating conference. Uh, it, it, it draws uh, a number of practitioners, both from Native and Tribal education, and also others of us who are l looking to learn about that fascinating uh, area of dropout prevention. So that's in Oklahoma City, March uh, 6 through 9. You know, I love that that's become an annual event. I remember it started mm -hmm. several years ago, but it, it is a different lens for looking at dropout prevention and so much that all of us can learn from each other. It is. It's, it's a very exciting conference. And then uh, in June, uh, June the 26th through the, 9th, through the 29th down in Kissimmee, Florida, uh, we have our Reaching the Wounded Student Conference. Uh, as, as many of you know, uh, students of trauma, trauma-impacted students, Students are a real uh, challenging group in dropout prevention. And so we have, have partnered with Dr. Joe Hendershot and a number of other great presenters, and that conference focuses on reaching students who've had significant trauma in their lives that impact their potential to graduate. So that's in June, June 29th in Kissimmee, Florida. All three of these events are up for registration on our website. Just uh, go to www.dropoutprevention.org, look at the conference events, click on them, and I would also point out that all three of these events carry professional learning credits for the National Dropout Prevention Certification Program. Oh, now someday we're going to have to do a program on that. We had our first two completers oh, of really? the program. The first two National Dropout Prevention Specialists uh, were awarded their certificates in San Antonio last month, Marty. Well, I know our viewers will want to learn more about that, so let's plan that for the future for 2016. Certainly. Yes, two graduates already. We're on our way. Mm -hmm. Well, this is great. Well, we have a wonderful program today. We do want to get started on it. And for those of you who are first-time viewers, you may not realize that all the stuff that's on this website for from the National Dropout Prevention Center are resources for this particular program so it can be a form of professional development for your community or for your school your community and whatever so looking at those resources there's uh, all kinds of things I'm, I'm gonna save one for the end of this conversation but I know people also like to converse about a topic and so we're trying to provide 
ways for them to do that. Now, Sandy and I can do this discussion board really <laughs> well. You know, I think just about everybody can type in a little comments and have a conversation, and that's up there on the website to do. But the stuff that we're not so well versed in, but we're going to share, uh, is tweeting, right, Sandy? And so we have two Twitter accounts that are be relevant for today's program, and I will, uh, it will be put them up on the screen for you. It's one is at ndpcn and the other is at coach-rudy, and uh, that is because of our guest. Mm -hmm. And the a thread, in other words, I've been told the topic would be the hashtag SEL, which will segue really into what our topic does address today, which is social emotional learning mm -hmm. and uh, what, um, what our guest is gonna be talking about. But uh, the final resource I did wanna mention was one a student made from about this program, and it's on the website. Some of you may have actually seen it uh, when you heard the promotion about this, mm -hmm. because we put that as a link on there too to say this is what's coming. And so I, I, I just love student-made work, and so I wanted to point that one out in particular, Sandy. But you know, um, we, we've got a lot of good things coming up in the new year, but we got something really great today that we need to get started on. <laughs> and we've got some folks waiting for us in Texas, in Austin, Texas. So Sandy, why don't you uh, introduce us and get us started? It's my pleasure to, Marty. Um, Mr. R. Keith Matheny was a recent recipient of the National Dropout Prevention Center's Crystal Star Award, which I think of as the Emmys of Dropout Prevention. Uh, the Crystal Star Award recognizes excellence, both of individuals and programs that have, have made tremendous impact on the world of dropout prevention. Um, R. Keith Matheny has taught at the high school level, at the college level, and at the graduate school level. Uh, Keith has championed the development of freshman support programs uh, particularly, particularly, Keith has uh, developed a program and has implemented this program in the Austin Independent School District, which has made a significant difference. Uh, we know that student engagement is significant. We know that student uh, empowerment to, to drive their own learning is, is a major uh, factor in keeping students in school. And Keith has been the driving force behind the creation of something called the MAPS program. Now MAPS stands for Methods for Academic and Personal Success. But the MAPS program over a four-year period in the Austin Independent School District has made such a significant difference. It has reduced the, the freshman failure rate by 41 percent, mm. it has reduced dropouts by 30 percent, and has reduced discipline referrals by 71 percent among the impacted students. Wow. This is a phenomenal program. Wow. Uh, Mr. Matheny has spoke on this program at events. He promotes it. He shares it with others. He's written about it. Uh, Keith has uh, the energy that I couldn't possibly <laughs> capture in an introduction. So Marty, uh, let's hear from Keith. Let's hear from Keith. Hey Keith, welcome to Solutions. Hi, Marty. Hi, Sandy. I'm very excited to be with you and very excited for this opportunity to share a very important message with your viewers. Well, that's great. I think I think we're raring to get started. I am because I hadn't met you until today. And so I'm looking forward to this. OK, so let me get started then. Um, if you'll look at the bring up the first slide. So the really overarching question of what we're really asking is, what are the skills we most want for students when they graduate? What are the things that you know, we really hope our students can do when they graduate from high school? And I'm gonna start by telling a story, and I'll click to the next slide to go to that next story. But uh, I'll tell a story from when I was a kid. So when I was a teenager, I was 16 years old, and my dad went away on a trip. And he said, while I'm on this trip, you can drive my truck. And I was excited about that, to drive the truck back and forth to school. So I'm a teen and getting to drive a truck. And a couple of days into the trip, uh, this light comes on. So when this light comes on, I think to myself, oh my goodness, uh, this doesn't really apply to me. I gotta tell dad about it when he comes home. You know, that's how a teenager thinks. It's not really about, about me. I gotta get this fixed when dad comes home. Well, had I solved the problem at that point in time, it would have cost about $25, which is the next click. And that would have you know, been an easy solution. But I kept driving. And a few days later, I'm driving, I'm driving, and then these lights come on. And I think to myself, oh my goodness, I really need to tell dad about this when he comes home. Uh, but again, I don't do anything about it. 
and I keep driving, and a few days later, then black smoke shoots out the back of the truck, and what I've done is I've cracked the engine head. <laughs> and so, obviously, when my dad comes home, he was very unhappy with me, and he had to pay $5,000 to fix the engine. Here's a shot of that. This isn't my dad, it's an actor played to play my dad. <laughs> uh, but it, it cost $5,000 for him to fix it. And the reason I tell this story is because I believe this is what I'm going to talk about all day today. The concept that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Um, when you look at what we're doing in education today, we're very reactionary. And you look at the issues we have in our society and we respond or we react after there is violence or there is bullying or there is an issue on a campus. And the reality is, is that uh, that's not very useful. And the question becomes for educators on the ground level, when all these resources come in after the event happens, you know, the question is, hey, where were you six months ago? You know, we could have taught some skills or done some things that might have prevented this, in, this, this happening. And the reason I say that is because we need to change that approach. We need to take a proactive approach. And a proactive approach is going to require teaching some skills that are going to help students be more successful, manage their emotions, build healthy relationships, and resolve conflicts. And so we'll go to the next slide. This is what I'm going to be talking about. So uh, the first thing I'm going to spend time talking about is what are the skills we really want for kids um, as they graduate? Why is freshman year so pivotal for students? Why, you know, why, why freshman year? Why target freshman year in particular? What is social emotional learning and why is it important? How do we teach these skills? And we're going to hear that from me and also from some students. And then how can an SEL based freshman seminar transform a school? And if you look on the right, I've got a number of resources for you to check out. Um, those are also going to be, I believe, on a link on the website um, for this broadcast. But there's some good stuff to check out. All right, so let me start by saying, what is emotional intelligence? So where SEL came from was a book by Dan Goldman in the 90s. He, based it, he wrote a book, Emotional Intelligence. And his big finding really was that EQ or your emotional intelligent quotient is a better predictor of success in life and happiness in life than IQ. And all of us kind of know this already anecdotally. If I can ask all the viewers to take a second and think, does everybody know somebody who is super bright but isn't able to make life work because they struggle with relationships or managing their emotions? My guess is Sandy and Marty do. Sure. And instead of having you guys tell me who they are, my point is, is that we all know somebody like that. And what this is an anecdote of is that really it is our social emotional skills that are better predictors of success in life um, and happiness in life than really it is our IQ. And if I reverse that, I bet everybody and even our viewers would say that they know somebody who's really good with people, but they're not the sharpest tool in the shed. They're, they're very, very good with their people skills, um, and they're very, very good with their relationship skills, but they're not great, you know, they're not the most intelligent uh, person when you talk to them, and those people often are thriving. And the, the point that's being made is that the bottom line is, is that students, people, teachers, I mean, we're all more successful if we can develop these social-emotional skills. So there's an organization called CASEL, which is the Collaborative for Academic Social Emotional Learning. It's a fantastic organization. I'm thrilled to get a chance to work with them quite a bit. And they identified five key competencies of social emotional learning. And those five competencies are, on the slide here, self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, uh, relationship skills, and responsible decision-making. And I'll just kind of break them down for a second. So let's talk about self-awareness. So self-awareness is knowing what you're, what's going on with you, uh, what you're good at, what areas you need to work on. Um, that's social awareness. Self-management is probably the one that I think we fail at the most. Um, for example, self-management, um, all your life, everybody, all the viewers, all my students, we've had people say to us, hey, relax, calm down, relax. And if they think about that, who the heck ever taught you what that meant? I mean, all your life, somebody's been saying relax, 
and nobody has taught you what that meant. And we wonder why students aren't good at calming down or managing strong emotions. We have to teach it. If, they, if they're gonna know it, we have to teach it. The next one is social awareness. And social awareness is understanding what's going on with people around you so you can better navigate the world. Um, you know, there's a right and a wrong time to ask your parents for something. There's a right and a wrong time to ask your teacher for something or, you know, a potential date or your boss for a day off. Understanding social awareness helps you navigate the world more effectively and helps you feel and show empathy for others, which is a key for relationships. And relationship skills, um, probably the thing I like to talk about with the relationship skills is this one quote. And if you only heard one thing I said today, here's the one thing I would hope every viewer hears. And that is that life is all about relationships. The rest is really just details. And if we can teach students how to build more healthy relationships, then we're gonna have more positive classroom cultures, we're gonna have a more positive emotional setting for learning, and not just for students, but for teachers, staff, everybody. Last but not least is responsible decision-making, which you really need all those things in order to be effective at responsible decision-making. And that's the work of social emotional learning, and it's the work of CASEL, which is, again, a fantastic organization. And then also, really quickly, I wanna mention AISD, Austin Infinite School District, who I work for, who really are leaders in social emotional learning. We have an amazing program here in the district that really emphasizes social emotional learning, and I really believe that we're one of the leading districts doing this work. Well, you know, Keith, that just seems really smart to me. Uh, you're talking about a foundation of something before you start to build on it. You know, we've done programs here on school climate, and this I couldn't help but be struck by the similarities between what you're talking about uh, for an individual uh, with the, uh, the foundational needs of a school climate. And so they really go hand in hand. Um, wouldn't you say, Sandy? Definitely, Marty. The, obviously, the, the behavioral side of, of mm -hmm. success in, in the life of a student is, is tremendous. And, and this particular year, before they start high school, Keith, that's the foundation these kids need. That's such mm -hmm. a tough time. Mm -hmm. it is. So I, I think we just wanted to, to, I just had to make that notice that this is a foundational, that was a key word you said. No, I agree, and thank you for saying that, Marty, and uh, obviously, uh, Sandy, thank you as well. Um, this, is, uh, this is something that we really need to put uh, first. Uh, what I mean by that is, is that if we have this foundation, students can achieve way more. It's, you know, being able to manage your emotions and build healthy relationships is going to lead to more on-task behavior, uh, a lot less issues on campus and, you know, in the classroom, a lot less redirection for teachers, and that's what you're gonna see as we go through this presentation. That's really the main result of this, is more time on task for teachers. And I like to say that social emotional learning is a time maker, it's not a time taker. Mm -hmm. The time you spend doing this, it really pays off and more time on task for students and teachers. Yeah, excellent, excellent. So the next thing I wanna mention is a trend that's an issue that we all know about, we're all very aware of, and that's the next slide. But, you know, Albert Einstein said years ago that I fear the day that technology will surpass our human interaction and the world will have an, a generation of idiots, <laughs> smartphones and dumb people. You know, this is, uh, I mean, amazingly prophetic um, and not surprising, but what's interesting is, is if you look around society nowadays, if you go back 20 years, you can remember when everybody went outside to play and we had five or six friends that we had to negotiate. What are we gonna do today? You know, what are we gonna, we're gonna do a dirt clod war? Are we gonna go for a bike ride? Are we gonna, you know, what are we gonna do today? And by doing all of those interactions and that collaboration and that negotiation, you build a lot of social emotional skills. And today we have so much technology and I'm not saying technology is a problem. Technology is making this broadcast right now possible. It can be a wonderful thing. But the blooming rose of technology has major thorns in social and emotional <laughs> skills. You know, if, if we're not careful, we are raising people who are experts, but are not good at relating to others and are not good at managing their emotions. And it scares me to death when I go to a restaurant and I watch a family walk in and, you know, the dad's on his cell phone checking stocks and, you know, the, the, the mom's doing Facebook and both kids come in playing video games and they only stop doing it to listen to the, uh, the waiter or waitress when they make their order. 
it's a scary thing. And we have to build more social emotional learning skills and practice into our schools to address this growing gap. It's like the things that we naturally did have been um, taken over by technology and eliminated and we have to teach things that just happened naturally in the past in our childhood, Sandy. And it's such a realization that, that what Keith's talking about is to teach the whole child. Yes. Uh, we can't just teach the content, we have to teach the foundational behaviors and understandings and skills that, that underlie those things, Marty. Yeah. And, and I think probably in the past, this is a very key point, I think, about technology. You see it all the time. Um, but I think this, was a, this was, has always been a problem with a, a lot of young people. They just haven't learned how to cope. And so this has just added a whole other layer of difficulty to it, I think. And so it's great that uh, Austin is taking this on as a challenge. It is. Yeah, and I just want to mention right real quickly that it's not just Austin. Um, there's a Collaborating Districts Initiative uh, which features districts all across the country, which are part of CASEL's uh, Collaborating Districts mm -hmm. Initiative. And um, I've had a chance to work with other districts, but there's great groups in you know, Chicago and in Nashville and in Atlanta and in Cleveland and Anchorage. And then I've done a ton of work with both Austin and with Washoe School District uh, in Reno, Nevada, and I can say they're also doing an awesome job. All the districts are doing a great job with this and hopefully modeling something that's going to spread really hopefully to all districts and all students soon. Yeah, so so I'd like to go great. to the next point. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. I was just gonna, oh, go ahead. I was just so, gonna, can uh, I ask like you one thing, up. Keith, while yeah, you sure. mention that network, because I'll forget it. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that is viewers can find a way to connect to this network or do they go through um, you or is there something? Sure, sure. I mean, I'm going to put resources at the end with my email, yeah. with the email for the okay. Austin Independent School District's uh, Social Emotional Learning Department. Um, their director, Sherry Raven, is fantastic and they have a whole great staff that you can reach out to. Um, also, there will be a link to a castle and as well to the curriculum that I use, uh, the high school curriculum, School Connect. Yeah, well, this is great because we are a network, mm -hmm. and one of our major goals is to connect people, exactly. especially to something excellent like this. Okay, sorry to interrupt. No problem, please. So the next slide I want to talk about is why is freshman year so important? Um, and there's been lots of studies on the, the, the point that freshman year is really a watershed year. There was a study by the University of Chicago that found that failures in the first year of high school make students significantly more likely not to graduate and that students that are on track as freshmen are three and a half times more likely to graduate. So all signs really point to the first year setting the tone for school. And I can say this from personal experience. I have 300 freshmen every year and have had so for the last seven years. That's 2,100 freshmen, many of which have been characterized as at risk. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you from experience that, you know, if we can get those kids that, that struggle freshman year, um, they struggle as they keep going and the ones that you can get off on the right foot generally gain that momentum and maintain that momentum all the way through their high school career and then obviously sets a foundation for their future. Keith, you're absolutely right. Uh, ninth grade is a critical point in time. Uh, if, if a student comes into the ninth grade with, with skills yet to learn or if, they're, if they need uh, to catch up, that's when it has to happen. And it's also when, when a student must make some significant adjustments into the high school mm -hmm. uh, style and, so, and climate. And so this is a perfect timing to inject this. Uh, I agree. And if you think about, if I asked you right now, if I said, hey, how many of you would take a job where you're going to have eight different bosses and these eight different bosses are going to all have different requirements for you. So you'll have a different job description in each of your eight jobs and your eight bosses are not going to talk to each other at all. So basically that's what our freshmen are facing. They're coming in from a place where they've had their hands held a little bit more. So all of a sudden they have eight different people that they're working with and negotiating eight different classrooms with policies. And on top of that, they're in a Molotov cocktail because they have um, a lot of emotions that are going on because they have strong hormones in their system. They're in novel adult relationships that they haven't really been in as much before. And oh, by the way, they're playing for keeps. All of a sudden their grades now count and they're part of their permanent record. So there's a whole new social you know, environment to navigate and it requires a lot of skills. 
And I really feel we are failing our freshmen if we do not provide that foundation from day one and say, hey, this is what's going on here. Here's how you make high school work. You know, here are the challenges and here are some skills to deal with those challenges. I just think it's it's um, amazing that this is not always done. Wow, that was good. Yeah. <laughs> that really sold, you sold me. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, and so, you know, teaching students to manage their emotions, build healthy relationships, uh, make better decisions, and have a vision for their future is essential for all students. I'm not saying it should just happen freshman year. I think it should happen pre-K through 12th grade. I'm just saying that freshman year is a perfect developmental niche mm -hmm. to stick this in and help them make a really big jump, um, you know, a critical mass, so to speak. <clears throat> And so there's actually tons of data about social emotional learning. This is not a brand new thing. Um, if you look at the next slide, it's going to show you a meta analysis. So there was a study done by Durlock, Weisberg, and DeMickey that studied over 270,000 students. Um, and it showed tons of powerful effects. It showed um, when students got high quality, um, research-based social-emotional learning um, programs that they had a 23% increase in SEL skills. No surprise, you teach them to manage their emotions, they're better at managing their emotions. They had a nine-point gain in attitudes about their self, others, and school. They had a nine-point gain in pro-social behavior. I'm gonna skip the next one for a second. They had a, a nine points down in problem behaviors and 10 points down in emotional distress. And one of the ones that's, mo that's really exciting and again, I'm not really buying into the whole focus on standardized testing, but if we could just get a 3% gain on a standardized test, everybody's high-fiving and celebrating and getting blue ribbons and all that stuff, and they found an 11-point gain on standardized tests when you start teaching these kids these skills. And it's an interesting byproduct because you wouldn't think that managing your emotions would dramatically affect test scores, but then you think about it, hey, they can manage their stress there's less emotional disturbance in the class, there's more time on task, you know, they're more bought into why this stuff is important. And all of those things really do end up equating to higher test scores. And that's, that's almost the name of the game as well, well, it in fact, test mm. scores. And, and um, I'm glad you saved that for last because that just puts up period at the end saying like, so there. <laughs> and you know, yeah. Marty and Keith, so, so many times uh, educators will, will have the first response, well, I don't have time to teach this affective stuff. I've got my content that yeah. I'm required to teach. Yeah. But yet the, the affective side of life reinforces and enhances the content and actually makes the achievement possible. Right, and as it does go down to more time on task too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a beautiful point, Sandy. Mm -hmm. You know, you think about the student who just broke up with her boyfriend. <laughs> You know, that kid who just broke up with her boyfriend, they're not going to learn algebra today. You know, not unless they understand how to manage that emotion and compartmentalize it. You know, and they might, you know, for some freshmen, they might not learn anything for that week that they broke up with their boyfriend. So we really, you know, that's an example of one of the things that we have to teach. Because if you don't teach that, uh, that affective side, like Sandy's saying, then we're not going to get to the high-hanging fruit on the academic tree. It's kind of like Maslow's hierarchy. Mm -hmm. And so what I'd like to do now is I'd like to show what the class looks like. We have a short documentary about the class, um, and it's going to not only talk about the class, it's going to have me talk again a little bit, but also it's going to have some student interviews. And this is a documentary that was made by uh, one of the teachers at Austin High and his video productions group, uh, Mr. Gil Garcia. So can you please cue that video? Up it goes. I can't mm -hmm. wait to see it. guys can ever relate to a time that you had a priority that was really important to you but then you got caught up in other little meaningless things and you ended up losing track of a really important priority. Not on your desk that's ever happened to you. One bag per set of students. My name is Keith Matheny. I'm a teacher. I teach MAPS. Um, I'm also an instructional coach for the district uh, for the Department of Social Emotional Learning and I am a model teacher for School Connect. MAPS is a class and a program that is designed to teach success skills to students um, that are making a very challenging transition into high school. It stands for Methods for Academic and Personal Success. 
and the class really focuses on teaching them the five core competencies of SEL skills, which are self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationship skills, and decision-making. We spend a lot of time on academic success skills, uh, organization, note-taking, uh, keeping an organized planner, and then there's definitely a part of it too that's a little bit of a nag, you know, that you're basically on the students about their grades and checking grade speed and conferencing. But really when it comes right down to it, the bulk of the class is a collaborative environment where students are actively working on SEL skills. They're learning more about themselves, how to manage their emotions, how to calm down, um, how to make better decisions, how to build healthier relationships, how to set goals, how to see a vision for their future. It's all about the skills they really need to be successful in life that we all know aren't always directly taught. And that's what this class is all about. That's what I did in college. I'll have a piece of paper, and just for that time that I'm trying to stay focused, I'll make a little tally mark on the sheet of paper every time my mind wanders. And then my goal is to have the fewer number of tally marks during that 15 minutes of work time. Doing math class, it's a it's a lot of lessons. It, what we do, we learn how to get through high school, how to get through relationship problems. It really helps you get started as a freshman. Uh, organization, like relationship skills and stuff like that, it really helps you just get started, so you're not by yourself. You know. I think a lot of freshmen are like, oh, it's high school. You know, at first they're gonna be like, I think it takes freshmen like they have to settle into high school and it helps a lot to learn how to settle into things, you know, because me personally, I think there's a big difference between middle school and high school. So I'm like, settling in, it was hard. But Mr. Rossini helped me with the planners and like learning little things that helped you go further in life. It's a big deal, you know, to be able to learn these things. In the beginning of the year, he taught us at a handshake that people would judge you on it. So you have to have like a good mesh and like a strong, firm handshake. I didn't know that before that your handshake was like like a first impression thing. We do um, activities like we did a lesson the other day where we put the rocks and beans in a cup, and the beans represented um, little things like on time like on your phone, and the rock represented like projects and stuff. And it helps us understand like get the lesson across better. The activities like is a big part of it. It makes people. Um, I guess more social, talk more. If you interact with other people, you kind of see how they, how they think, how they manage their time, and then you can also learn from them and maybe manage your time using their, their system. Maps is different from any other class because you're able to, you, we talk about things that other classes wouldn't talk about, like something that's you get to talk about personal things if you choose to, and like it helps you, I guess, be be more open. It was like a place where you, you can talk about what's on your mind without no one judging you, and he's there to help you out, and he's trying to get that to everyone. You know, I don't know, it was like we were just one big family, we all got along together. And like someday, some kid probably had a bad day, but we were all there for him, like cheering him on, and Mr. Matheny was there to cheer him up. It taught us how to be proactive, and except for reactive. And that kind of that kind of helped me out in a relationship because after my parents got divorced, it was kind of hard. And my dad, we were arguing a lot, and I used to like punch hole punch holes in the wall with my anger. But then after after proactive reactive, and my dad would argue, I would just go to my room, just scream at a pillow or something, just be sign like hurting myself, being proactive, then doing a reactive as hurting myself and like punching the wall. At the beginning of the class, I was just stubborn. I was really stubborn. I didn't like, I didn't like talking. I didn't like doing any of that. And throughout the whole process, he was always there. He was on me. He was like, "You do this," and, you, and he was just always on me. And so that like that bettered me. Like I got my whole attitude changed from that class. It makes a huge difference in some kids' lives. The stories that come out of this room are, are amazing to me. 
I have students all the time that talk about a major life change or a major relationship change at home, you know, that they were able to, you know, learn something and then apply it that night to a key relationship or to a key decision. Uh, that is really, really rewarding for a teacher. On top of that, um, the, the empirical data is really strong. We've had maps at Austin High for four years. And in those four years, we've reduced freshman failures by 41% and freshman referrals by 71%, which is a transformative number. This past six weeks is probably the highlight so far of me teaching it. And the freshmen that have maps this past six weeks pass 92% of their classes, which is unheard of for freshmen. When we started this program, we had found that over 60% of our failures on our campus were freshmen and over 60% of our referrals on our campus are freshmen. And I really don't think that's unlike other campuses. MAPS class is on five campuses in the district and each of the five campuses is doing it slightly differently. So there's Bowie, who has a targeted group of students, McCallum, Austin High, all have target groups of students. And our target group of students is grade level ninth graders. At other schools like LBJ and Crockett, every freshman is taking this class. And really in the ideal model, you want every freshman to get this class because, you know, the kid that is a very, very strong student also needs emotional management and stress management and organizational skills. Freshmen need some kind of transition to help get them focused in on why school is important and how to make school work for them. And then also to build some skills about relationships and emotional control. And that's where MAPS steps in. You know, Marty, as I watch that video, I'm reminded of, of what most of our viewers would probably agree is the biggest question or concern in the minds of an incoming freshman coming into a high school from a whole different environment. Mm -hmm. Typically, that's when they change buildings, they change staffs, they change culture, they change rules, they change environments. And the biggest question, I'm almost certain in every freshman freshman's mind on the first day of school or the, right before the first mm -hmm. of school is, will I be successful? And probably the second question is, will I be accepted? Uh -huh. And so if you think about the issues and the challenges and the problems that, that freshmen face and, and some of the, the missteps that they make, uh, they're probably all rooted in those two things mm -hmm. because they need to feel successful, they need to feel accepted. And so what I'm thinking the MAPS course does, it says we're gonna give you almost guaranteed success if you will follow what we do in this class. And so, so we're actually giving a, a, a tremendous underlayment of support to these kids for, for those two questions that are probably the drivers of many of the problems that we face in the ninth grade. Oh, I think so. What I was really struck by in the video was, first of all, being allowed to go into that classroom mm -hmm. and see what's going on. And I love the, um, the concreteness of the curriculum, both with mm -hmm. the pour the beans mm -hmm. and so forth and things like that and, and on the the, the shaking mm -hmm. hands and the who's the best handshaker at all. Mm -hmm. I love all that stuff and that's a great transition piece mm -hmm. for those who have been in middle school. I mean that particular piece w was huge to me but the other thing was developing a community of people who cared about each other. They did all these things together in groups and they developed, as you often do in settings like this, a community of people who cared. And so it's how he's doing that which I think is so extraordinary and successful. So uh, I'm so glad we were able to take people to to uh, Texas and mm -hmm. see what they do. Absolutely, Marty. Yeah, so well now, oh my goodness. Oh, we, we have, have company. We have company. <laughs> Who have you got with you, Keith? So I have two of my students that have come, two former MAP students. Um, on my right, this is Desiree Reyes. Um, Hi, Desiree. And then this is Ian White on my left. Yeah. And they're going to tell you a little bit about their perspective on the class and maybe even mention a little bit of one of their favorite lessons. So I'll let Ian take it away. All right. Uh, well, one of the most important things I think about uh, maths class is that it's, um, like as uh, Mr. Matheny mentioned in the video, is uh, it's, it's excellent um, period to help uh, students transition into 
uh, transition into high school because you're going into this much more mature environment from you know from middle school. You know, you have all these uh, much older people. You have 18 year olds. Uh, all these much uh, harder, more difficult classes, and you know, for some students they get stressed. They uh, they're not really ready for it yet. They're they, they kind of just get hit with all this work all at once. They're not really prepared for it. And maths class is really one of the best ways of helping students out with that. Like uh, one of the activities we do in um, class, like the beginning of every day, is Mr. Matheny. He uh, uh, he tell he asks us to tell uh, uh, him something good about our day or week that's happened recently. And, after, you know, we all tell him something good that happened recently. He says, that is good news. And then we all clap. It's, uh, it's a really nice chance for us to all to get, uh, you know, let off our chest something we've been wanting to tell people. But haven't really, um, you know, we haven't really had somebody to tell it to before. Because in maps class, it's all very, uh, like, uh, Mr. Matheny, he encourages us to be open. He encourages us to talk to other students, to, um, you know, to t talk about our problems and not just keep it all uh, bunched up inside. So what are some of the things that you think um, it's, what are those, some of the results that you think you've gotten out of the class? How's it helped you? Uh, well, I'd say it's really helped me with my, like some of my experiences. I've, well, not, not experiences, I mean, uh, relationships with my, uh, with both of my family and with my friends before, because, um, you know, back to the, uh, video again, like um, with handshakes, I think that's a really important part of any first impressions whenever you're uh, getting to meet somebody for the first time. Whenever you give somebody a good handshake, you know, sometimes they may notice it, sometimes they may not, but it's still, uh, you know, a very important part of whenever getting to know somebody, giving them eye contact, uh, you know, asking, hello, how are you, what's your name? So I think that's um, very important. And, um, and um, like in my family life, uh, my parents have mentioned to me how they notice I just seem ha like happier a bit more, I just seem brighter, um, and I just feel more open to talking with them about uh, things I feel you know, on the inside that I guess I just uh, haven't thought about talking with them about before. Cool. So you wanted to talk about a lesson? Do you have a favorite lesson? Uh, yeah, I had a few favorite lessons, but one of the ones that really stood out to me was the lesson Rocks in a Jar. Now, um, that was also played in the video, and uh, basically the core idea of the, of the lesson was, you know, finding balance in life and prioritization. Now, um, we don't actually have rocks here, we actually just have golf balls and beans, alright? Thank you. So let's, uh, let's imagine for a moment that all these small beans here, rocks, are, uh, you know, like the small things in life that, um, you know, that we like to do, that we like to make time for, like playing video games, hanging out with friends and such, and so we we'll imagine the cup is all your time you spend. Now, as you can see here, if you spend all of your time, you know, doing the little things that don't really matter that much in life, and then you try to focus on the big things, which are like relationships with family and friends, it just doesn't work. It doesn't fit. You're becoming overburdened. You're staying up till two in the morning doing a project, and you know you missed out on like going to a game with some friends or. <laughs> Uh, parents and it just doesn't work. You're, you know, you've had all of your time spent. But, but if you focus on the big things, the more important things that matter in life first, and then make time, what time you can have, with the small things, it all just fits. Wow! I need that lesson. <laughs> <laughs> what a great lesson. Uh, it's, you know, one of the things that I want to mention is the rigor in this class is not really what's taught so much in the class. It's the internalization and application of what's being taught in the class to life. It's easy to learn something like rocks in a jar. It's completely different to then start learning how to prioritize and really putting your big rocks mm -hmm. first. Um, and I think that's really what makes the class um, powerful is when you can get students to take it out and make it relevant and apply it in their lives. Yeah. And so let me let Desiree talk about it a little bit. Uh, okay, so in my year of maps, the one lesson that stood out to me the most was uh, first impressions because uh, as growing up, I was just naturally shy and I wouldn't make the best impressions. Like I wasn't the bad kid in the class, but I wasn't the best kid either due to my first impressions being like closed off in a way and kind of away from everybody. And then, so the very first day that um, 
of class, we took um, the handshake and how to make eye contact and um, what are the best ways to make first impressions. And ever since then, it's like impacted the way I've talked to my teachers. Like last year, I made it a point at the very last day or like the last week of school to talk to the teachers that I have this year and just introduce myself to them. So this year, when I came back into class, I pretty much was on their good side and um, it was just pretty cool to know that if you make a good first impression, it pretty much sets you up for the rest of the year with the teachers. Um, and then like Ian was saying, the just emotionally being ready and learning and more comfortable in a classroom, like with the good news, um, it just sets a good environment in the classroom wise and it just keeps you um, like you feel comfortable enough to be free in that class that you don't feel stressful like when you're doing your work and stuff it just feels like you're going at your own pace um, and learning new things every single day with Mr. Matheny. Good. Um, was there a favorite lesson that you had that you wanted to talk about? I did. Um, the one of the biggest lesson that stood out to me when we were in maps was the lesson about your brain, which is how your brain um, affects SEL. So basically, your fist is the representation of your brain, and this wrist area is your stem part of the brain, and then your thumb is the neocortex, and the upper fingers are the prefrontal cortex. So basically, your stem is what you do naturally, which is like your when you're breathing or digesting your food, like you don't have to think about it to do it, it just happens. And then your thumb is your emotions. So we like to call it your monkey brain because usually when you're dealing with your emotions and you don't have control over it, it just overrules your body. And then your prefrontal cortex is your computer brain, which is the part of the brain that you use when you're learning in class or you're doing homework, something that's proactive and helping you um, learn in education. So the main idea of the, of the lesson was that when you let your emotions overrule, you flip your lid. So now you're being ruled by your emotions and not with the logical part of your brain. Um, and the reason we call it the monkey brain is because usually when monkeys are excited, they get, or just in general, they're ruled by their emotions and they act on their emotions and don't really think through the process. And then when you're doing the computer brain, you use your logic and you think and you take steps to do and find the, or solve the problem. So when you flip your lid, whether it's you're super excited or really angry, you just lose your logical sense, which is why we tend to get in trouble more often because we're not thinking logically. So the whole bit, the whole lesson was just to like think through before you act on something, um, especially if you're feeling really strong emotions at the time. Yeah. Well, lots of good lessons yeah. here. Great we're lessons. the ones who are learning today, great lessons, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> this is great. Oh, thank you um, both for sharing these stories. Great stories, great lessons. Yeah, so they're obviously both great kids. Um, and I think a lot of the kids will talk a lot about similar uh, lessons, but there's many, many lessons in there that the, the kids re relate to and then can re reflect on even you know years after taking the class. Mm -hmm. Both of these students took the class um, two years ago, and I picked students from the past on purpose just to see you know, if there's some retention, is there some carryover after you take the class? Um, and so I think that's exciting. Yeah, it's got to make you feel really good, mm -hmm. Keith, I know. Yeah. Well done. I, I, I love my work very, very much. I love my work, and these are some of the reasons why mm -hmm. I love my work. Right. I can so see it. let's talk about some data. Okay. So if you look at the next slide, um, okay. the data kind of really plays out in an interesting way. So, um, and first, I really want to make the clear point that this is Austin High School data, not district-wide. It's just for Austin High School. But there is great data also for the whole district, but this data we're looking at is just Austin High in this pilot program. Okay. But in the first four years of doing this, freshman failures went down, as Dr. Addis said, 41%. And discipline referrals 
went down an amazing 71%. And it's exactly due to what uh, Desiree's talking about. You know, students learn to understand the concept of flipping your lid and how when we're emotionally hijacked or compromised, we make all kinds of big mistakes and they become more aware of that. And we teach them skills, that self-management, on how to then calm down, relax, and reconnect that thinking brain so that their limbic system isn't totally driving it and they can control their behaviors and make uh, decisions that will save their relationships and put them in a place to be successful. Um, and then that last number I wanna show you where it says campus 49%. Since we started the program, now as a campus, and this is this year's data, mm -hmm. now as a campus, we've reduced discipline referrals on our campus by 49%. So, and, and, and you, you don't realize how big that is because every discipline referral is a sign of a lot more going on with a kid. And when you're cutting your discipline referrals in half, you're talking about not just, you know, less referrals, but you're talking about really positive outcomes for lots and lots of students. And I think that's really important. Excellent well, results. Wow. Absolutely excellent results. It is. It's got to go everywhere, Sandy. <laughs> it, it does. Keith, I'm sitting here thinking if, if I were a, a principal or a superintendent or a school board member and I had nothing like this in my school and I viewed this, this broadcast that, that you guys have been so so great to do. Uh, and I'm thinking, well, maybe I could do that, but I'm sure it's gonna cost me a little money, that type of thing. Well, how, would you, how would you convince them? What would you say that would cause someone to do this? Okay, so great first question. Uh, it's a great question. Um, I just wanna say that next slide is really a big point of that. And that's this concept that social emotional learning is really a time maker. It's not a time taker. You know, that when you believe that, you know, we don't have time for another initiative, I don't have time for, you know, I've, I've barely got time to do what I'm doing. What's great about social emotional learning is there are studies that show that for every t amount of time, for every hour you spend doing this work, it benefits you 11 hours in time on task for teachers. And there's a study out of the University of Columbia that says that. And you can look at that link. We have that link on these resources. But SEL really is a time maker. It's not a time taker. And I think the next thing is you know, the how-to. And if we'll go to the next slide, I'll talk about some of the how-to. So I really believe in a dedicated course. Um, I think it's ideal to have a dedicated freshman seminar supported by advisory then after you know, um, you know, frequent years that can support the lessons. But that dedicated course lets students really soak in it. And you can get a strong teacher who this is their thing rather than somebody that dabbles in it, you know, that, you know, really I'm an English teacher and oh, by the way, I teach one section of freshman seminar. Um, and then you gotta find somebody who's passionate about students and good at building relationships. Of course, you're gonna need quality curriculum, training and support, and there's lots of resources out there and in this presentation that you can reach out to. You'll need administrative support. And then just like good teaching, SEL has a big part to do with engagement. You've got to use some engagement strategies on around state management and positive classroom climate and lots of collaborative activities. If we're going to teach social emotional skills, we have to provide social emotional opportunities to practice those skills. Yeah. Um, and the, you know, one of the things that I did when I first started doing this, I had lots of visitors come in and say, hey, Keith, you know, we want to re replicate this. We want to do this at our school. And so at first I was just sending emails of what I was doing the next week. So I would say, okay, next week I'm doing this. And I'd send an email out and that wasn't very organized. And I was very fortunate to partner up with some fantastic uh, ladies, Kathy Belland and Julia Douglas from School Connect, which is a national social emotional learning curriculum. Uh, both of them are very accomplished women. And I helped them rewrite School Connect to add more of the metaphors, engagement strategies, and all the multimedia. And if you look at the next slide, you can see what that resource looks like. Um, this is School Connect. And as you can see, it's got lots of different resources. Um, so it's the, it's the next, there it is. Um, and you can contact uh, schoolconnect.net if you're interested in looking at that. But I'm not talking about a product today. I'm talking about a practice. I think this is a fantastic product that helps you do this practice, but SEL is not a product, it is a practice. It needs to go all the way through your school. And with that, let me go to the next couple of slides to close. So if we go back to my initial question, 
and an initial comment that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So what's the real question? And the real question is not, you know, does it work? You know, d there's results, there's a meta-analysis, there's all kinds of studies about it. The real question is, what side of the quote do we want to be on? What side of the quote do you as educators watching this program want to be on? Do you want to be on the side of the quote of quality prevention? Or do you want to be on the side of the quote of, of attempted cure? And you need to realize that some of these issues are pretty hard to cure. And I think it's a shame that we are so reactive in education. We need to be more proactive. If you want to build a better world, in my opinion, the best way to build a better world is educate on the next generation and teach them skills where they can build that better world. You know, education is our best weapon and we need it. Um, the quote that I want to end on is this one next click. Um, I want to thank a couple of people while I do this, but Dr. Karstarfin was the superintendent in Austin when we first started this. And um, uh, Dr. Paul Cruz is our current superintendent who's done a great job of supporting it as well and extending it. But Dr. Karstarfin had a quote and she said that it is educational malpractice not to implement these programs. And she's now the superintendent at Atlanta Public Schools and she's now doing the same thing, trying to get that program in Atlanta. Um, and I actually got a chance to go work with them just recently, which was very exciting. But this is what we need to understand is that this is something that all students need. This is the, the lessons that I want my son and my daughter to know. And I'm sure everybody watching this, these are the things that you want your son and your daughter to know. And so one of the things that I can offer is I want to be a resource. I believe my mission in life is to continue to teach in the classroom. I love teaching this. I want to do it every day. But I also want to be a resource. So I hope that you'll reach out and connect. Um, I'm happy to help walk you through the product, the, the practice of doing this. Um, I can point you in the right direction on what resources to look into. And even if you're not going to look at curriculum, I'm happy to help. And if you are going to look at curriculum, especially for high school, I really recommend you look into School Connect. I think it's fantastic. And as far as overall a district implementation, um, I think there's lots of resources out there. I think uh, uh, the Department of Social Emotional Learning with AISD is a great one to reach out to and look at their website. Well, I think the National Dropout Prevention Center <laughs> and Network wants to be on the ounce of prevention side of that quote for sure. Certainly. And, and so I think our viewers out there are are probably um, siding up. If we did a survey, we'd see everybody over <laughs> on that side. Keith, I think, between uh, so. Desiree and, and Ian and yourself, you've really shared a powerful message with us today for which we extend great thanks and gratitude. You really have. Let, let's, let's fix that oil light early, folks. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. The first time I saw that oil light, I had no <laughs> idea what it was. I actually panicked. <laughs> so, well. anyway. Well, we, we thank you again and appreciate the efforts you've all made in Austin to connect yourselves with us here at Clemson. And that's not an easy task, but everybody here at Clemson Broadcast appreciates the work of your folks there and working together on collaboratively bringing this message to the world. We certainly yeah. do, and, and, and Keith, congratulations again on the Crystal Star Award, and uh, Desiree and Ian, thank you for your messages, thank you for those lessons. We will remember both those lessons that you taught us. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we really appreciate this honor. Thank you for getting the word out and all the people out there viewing. Thank you for making a difference. And I really believe there's always a reason that you get connected with these messages. And I hope that you will take this in your hands and do something special with it. And the last thing is hopefully they'll show the slide with some cool things to Google on some of the things that I've built uh, into the class and resources that I've used. We will. Thank you again. We will, and we'll actually have that on that website as well as here. But what a great program. And, and you know, Sandy, um, when it's a good show, the hour goes by so it fast. It does. It really does. And you just have such a joyful time um, seeing the wonderful things that people in the field are doing. Uh, the people that we're learning from in dropout prevention. It really does, Marty, and, and, and thank you, and, and thanks to, 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 to Keith and, and Desiree and Ian, and, and Merry Christmas to all our listeners and yeah. viewers. And so we do have that up on the screen right now as our parting gift for you for the, for the holidays. Um, and now it's, 
uh, sounds like Mickey Mouse Club, and now it's time to say goodbye. <laughs> but now it is time to say goodbye to all of you until next year when we will be back. And we've been talking about a lot of different programs, haven't we, Sandy? We got so many. We can't tell you which one's coming next because we've got so many to choose from. It's going to be a fantastic year in we 2016. Do have, we do have, Marty, but uh, uh, we'd encourage our viewers to check our website, uh, www.dropoutprevention.org, the world's most utilized dropout prevention resource. Uh, the information on this this webcast will be there. It'll be archived. Uh, the, the resources and the access to our events and our other resources are there. Yes, it's a great site. So I am here now to say farewell to you from 2015. It's been a great year, and we look forward to January. Remember, it's the second Tuesday of the month at 3.30, and we will see you then. Thanks for joining us. Good afternoon.